Okay. So we should have the PowerPoint up with my nice there. little Lego background here. And um, again, we're talking about the building blocks here. So glad to see that a lot of the polls uh, responses mentioned that you all have a uh, non-existent or a very small program that you want to build. Okay. And again, my name is Richie Kenny. I am down here at the University of Miami. Um, and while I'm presenting today, there are plenty of other institutions that offer intern housing. Um, and so, you know, I'm not the only expert out there. I'm one of. And um, during my research a few years ago, when we were trying to start this, I found every single person I reached out to, to be more than willing to help. Um, and so please, if I don't answer the question today, definitely reach out, definitely let me know. Um, but if there's somebody else that you know that runs intern housing at another institution, definitely reach out to them and uh, they should be more than willing to help you. <clears throat> okay. 65,000 internships are available every year in um, the United States of America. That's a lot of internships. And especially given what's going on with the economy, the pandemic and the job market, we should actually expect to see that number go up a little bit. I say that because it's easier for companies to hire an intern than it is to hire a full-time person. You don't have the benefits and the additional overhead that comes with hiring a full-time person. Now, when I say intern, um, we're not necessarily talking about uh, what you or what Hollywood may portray as the person just going to get coffee uh, for the executives for their meeting in the morning. Interns do anything and everything these days. They could be event planners. They could be running orientation for our institutions. Uh, they could be engineers, accountants, anything um, can be an internship these days. But the definition of an intern or an internship is a generally a student who is working with a company to learn something new about their intended trade. Think of it as your apprenticeship or your journeyman before you become that uh, master of the craft, okay? There are right now 12,615 summer-based internships posted on internships.com. Now, are all of those gonna be in your city? No, they're not. Are a percentage of those going to be available in your city? Yes. And depending on where you are, that could be a higher percentage or it could be a lower percentage. But I wanna tell everyone on this call right now that there are interns are in and around your institutions, okay? From Golden, Colorado, to Santa Clara, to Miami, where I'm at. Obviously we have New York, we have DC, we have Baltimore, and we have Atlanta. But there are internships and opportunities everywhere in this country. Um, and for our Canadian partners, if you're on the call, there are internships in Canada as well. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned that because a lot of times people may try to run a program or you may be new to an institution and your supervisor or your leadership may say, yeah, we tried that a couple of years ago, it just didn't work. Well, let's think a little bit broader, okay? And I'll come back to this number, but I wanna show everyone something real quick. For those of you that run conference programs right now, in order to make $252,000 on your summer, you have to sell three nights for 100 people 
at for 28 different groups. So that's 28 check-ins, 28 checkouts, and my math is probably off, but 2,800 or so rooms that your custodial staff now need to clean and turn over when you think of bed nights and everything else, okay? But let me show you how to make that much just in intern housing. So if you've got 100 interns to stay for their average summer, which roughly is 11 to 12 weeks, you don't have to do as much work. It is 100 people checking in and 100 people checking out, but you're not turning that same number of rooms. And you're able to have sustained revenue over the course of the entire summer at an easier pace than what you might have to do with conferences and events throughout the summer. Now, by no means am I telling you to get rid of your conference and event program, okay? That is a very important part of everybody's institution. And it provides a very valuable service for a lot of our community partners, uh, a lot of youth groups and religious groups around, around the country. But this is a way to help supplement and help improve your facility usage over the summer. Interns check in and then they go to work and then they're here at night, okay? So the revenue is a little bit easier to, to get and to maintain through an intern housing program than it is working our tails off uh, with conferences and events, okay? Now, that said, it's also not entirely easy and stress-free, just so everyone knows that as well. Now, I mentioned those 12,600 internships that were on internships.com. I asked Corey to send me a list of all of those individuals that had registered prior to today. And what I did is I plopped your institution on a Google map. And those are what those blue pins are. Those are everyone's institution. Now the green circles with the money symbol, that's the headquarters of the Fortune 1000, okay? So again, that's the headquarters of the Fortune 1000. Yes, you can see a large density in the Northeast Corridor, in and around Chicago, Michigan, and then a little bit more around North Carolina, South Carolina, and then obviously we have Silicon Valley out in the West. But there's only two institutions, three institutions on here that don't have a Fortune 1000 company headquarter within reasonable driving distance to your institution. Now, again, I wanna stress that just because you don't have something doesn't mean that you can't make this a successful program. We always talk about interns, but what about research? So I looked at just the CDC uh, and the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences, looking at the number of grants that they have funded within the United States for this past year. And you can see the number here based on density by, uh, by state. And a lot of those grants go to institutions of higher education. And what happens with grants? You have to hire staff. A lot of times they hire student researchers. These could be graduate students. They could be undergraduate students, doctoral students, you name it. Um, but we do have research institutions and faculty members, possibly in the building next door to us, conducting research, hiring these students, and they need a place to stay in the summer. 
So it may not be that you have um, a Fortune 1000 company headquartered in your state, but I'm willing to bet that you have a faculty member who's hiring students to come in during the summer and do research, whether it's on the multi-million dollar level or the $100,000 level. That student is still coming to your area and looking for a place to stay. So where do we start with all of this? Well, first, you have to do your market research. So where are you located? Where in the country? What, what are the industries around you? And what are the companies that are known within your area in your region? What I look at is about a 15 mile radius. That's a reasonable driving distance for here in Miami. But if you're a little bit more rural, maybe you look at something further up. All depends on kind of what people are comfortable with in terms of driving. Looking at your chambers of commerce in the area, they're always trying to attract new businesses to set up routes within your area. How can you partner with them? How can you figure out who is coming to your city and how do you help that company then know you're available to assist them? And we already talked a little bit about what your individual institutions do in terms of research or hiring interns already. Um, but maybe you have a medical division, maybe you have a hospital, maybe you have a school of law, and maybe there's law firms around you, or maybe you have a district or a county courthouse where students from other schools of law are coming to do their clerkships or working with a judge. Again, this goes from the mom and pop shop down the street who is looking for an intern to help them with social media all the way up to the Fortune 100 type companies where they have robust intern programs. An example down here, we have Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. They have a very robust internship program and we partner with them, but we're not their sole source of where those interns stay because they have other options. They have our friends down the street at Florida International University that they also stay with. And then they may be local. So you have to think about what percentage of the market share do you think you're reasonably going to attain when you go to launch this program? And I mentioned our friends down the street at FIU. I think they're on the call. Uh, I did see them uh, pre-registered. And so thinking about your own individual areas, who is around you that may also offer intern housing? And do they do it for external guests? Or do they really just partner up with a couple companies and they do it on the side? Now, you may have other higher ed institutions in the area but you can't just think about them when you're planning your project. And this is gonna be a project, by the way. Um, you need to look at all of those student housing based areas. Those that have transient populations that ebb and flow with the local student population. A lot of times we just call them off-campus partners or off-campus providers, but are they offering summer sublets that could eat into your business a little bit? Are they directly targeting interns? Are they going after the same share that you're going after? And they could be targeting one kind of company a little bit further north than you, and you may want to focus a little bit further south and everyone can maintain and be happy and be successful. 
I showed you, it only takes 100 interns to make that $252,000 revenue. Now your rates may be a little bit different and your timeline may be a little bit different, but I promise you, you can hit close to that number. So what else do you have to think about? You have to think about what regulations are in place. What about UBIT, unrelated business income tax, and what, what that may have to do with your uh, program? Well, for me here in, in Miami, I don't necessarily have to worry about that because an internship under our definition of UBIT works to our favor because we help educate these students by allowing them to stay with us. Definitely check in with your legal counsel though and your lawyers before just running with that. Um, it's always important to run everything by uh, our partners in legal counsel. And that question also comes up with taxes. Do you have to charge transit tax or hotel tax? depends on the area you're in, but for us in the state of Florida, there's actually a Florida administrative code that says students don't have to pay sales tax on housing if they're here longer than, um, I think it's 60 nights or 30 nights. So now that we've talked a little bit about what you need to do when you start, how do you write that business plan? What rates are you gonna charge? These are longer term stays, so they probably shouldn't be charged at the same rate as your two night, three night cheerleading groups. Or maybe you want to because it's a little bit simpler for the accounting. That's totally up to you. What is your capacity gonna be? How many beds are you gonna set aside for this program? You're gonna start with 100, maybe 50. Even if you set aside 25 beds, you're going to be successful here, okay? And then are you gonna market it in any way? How are you gonna market it? The answer there is, Yes, you need to market this because otherwise nobody's going to know you exist. But there's different ways that you market and that you target based on who you're going to go after. So are you going to target each business in your area and say, if you hire interns, they can stay with us? Or are you going to look at the individuals coming to your area, those students or those researchers coming to your particular institution, how you target them, what you go after, how you design the materials and the language that you use is gonna differ based on whether or not you're going after a company or you're going after an individual. And then if you're going for both, you definitely can't put out that same message for both. You have to tailor it so that you're really speaking to your suggested audience, okay? And then obviously you have to have contracts in place, you have to have agreements to cover yourself. But thinking about it, if you offer housing during the academic year, you can model that contract and agreement off of that academic year agreement. A lot of the things are gonna be the same. Additionally, you gotta think about your amenities. What are you gonna provide? Them? Are you gonna give them membership to the gym? Are you gonna give them parking? Um, some institutions now are, are moving strictly to an internet-based cable provider. Are you gonna give them access to that internet TV? And if you do, are you gonna charge them extra? Are you gonna have a premium package, a middle tier package? Are you going to offer them meals? I'll, I'll tell you all right now, I, I don't find much success when I offer 
interns meal packages. And, you know, why is that? They're out and off to the office by 7.30 in the morning. So they're just gonna grab something on the way. Or maybe they are trying to make that good impression and they are gonna stop at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or Caribou Coffee and pick the boss up something. And then a lot of times they're, they're not back by the time uh, our dinner period uh, starts and ends. So the value for the meals isn't there for it. So we're trying to think about some different ways. Maybe it's a grab and go. Maybe it's setting up a little kiosk in the, in the front lobby area. But this is all super customizable to each institution and is, is really what's going to set you apart. And the biggest piece of marketing here is going to be, it's going to be that word of mouth. The more interns you get from different institutions, the more connections you can build, the more webs you can spread out, and so on and so on. Okay. Now, see some questions coming in. So let me answer those for a moment. Question here from Jim. Do you do individual contracts or group contracts for interns? Uh, Jim, I do both. Um, and the reason is that I may have a company come to me and say that they want to guarantee housing for their five interns, 10 interns, from this period to this period. And so I'll do a contract with them and I'll make it a, a group contract, just like a hotel would uh, when you're doing a room block. And, you know, depending on the number, you could offer them a, a discounted rate. You could offer them an amenity package. It, it really just depends on, on the group and, uh, you know, if you think it can turn into a long-term thing. But I also do individual contracts. And for me, the majority of our business here in Miami is with individual contracts. I haven't quite figured out why, um, but um, you know, the market is a little bit more fluid with individuals. And uh, with our registration software, we, we find it pretty easy. Um, they have to upload a copy of their uh, transcript to prove that they're a current student. And they also have to upload a copy of their intern uh, offer letter so that we know that they're actually interning here in Miami. Um, we have had individuals submit forms for companies that are actually about 90 minutes north. And we reach back out to them and say, hey, look, we're not a good fit for you. Um, so while it's important for us to know that they are interning, it also helps us guide the individual to make sure that we are the right fit. See another question here. Um, do you offer interns with dorm style housing or apartment style? And do we offer to match them with a roommate? So, we have offered both. We have offered uh, traditional kind of suite style housing with two individuals, a bathroom, and, and shared between another two individuals. And then we've also offered apartment style housing. Apartment for us is a little bit uh, more expensive. We are in a brand new building. It does come with the full kitchen. So we provide pots and pans. Um, a simple a kitchen set with plates and silverware so that they don't feel like they have to bring those items. Um, but they do have to bring the TV, their clothes, obviously, uh, and bedding for the room. Um, in terms of preferences, typically it comes down to pricing. Uh, some internships you all will find that the employer pays a housing stipend and sometimes the student is funding it on their own. So they may be looking for the most economical option. 
the more you get into this and the more seasonality you have in terms of uh, the more years that you get under your belt, you may be able to start a scholarship program. You may be able to offer some of those individuals um, a discount to help them out. And then in terms of payments, you know, I've seen everything under the sun from requiring everything up front to taking it on a monthly basis, uh, a quarterly basis, or sending payments after the fact uh, and after they leave. I don't necessarily recommend that because you could get stuck holding the bag on that one. Um, but we do uh, offer to match them up with a roommate. And what we typically try to do is if they don't have a preference, we'll look at the companies or the experience that they're going to. Uh, you know, so we'll try and find two students marketing, uh, completing internships in marketing or maybe researching similar topics to, to build some of that interdisciplinary item. And uh, then we'll look at dates. So we'll try to find dates that line up as best as possible. Whitney's asking about the cancellation process and any fees there. Uh, Whitney, let me cover that in a few minutes. And then I see Jim is asking for to share the contract. Um, yes, I do have a copy of that somewhere. So Jim, I'll be getting that to Corey uh, and we'll be happy to share that. But I've been sitting on this slide here saying clearing the roadblocks. And what I've found Excuse me, my mouth is getting dry. What I found is that before you can even launch your program, you're going to have to overcome <clears throat> some roadblocks within your own institution. And sometimes that could just be people are more familiar with the status quo, or they have fear of offering a new program. It could be behavioral in that there may be a little bit of a laggard and they don't like to do some new stuff. It could be the procedural, right? I think I had a question come in earlier last week from Corey about talking about insurance. And one of the institutions requires that uh, individuals coming to stay on their campus have the same level of insurance as groups that would be staying with them. Now, in my mind, that doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense because if you're bringing 300 people, yes, you definitely want a $1 million at least liability. You definitely want your sexual molestation and sexual harassment um, insurance up to date. And having those coverages are there for a reason because you have so many people with the group. But with an individual, an individual is not going to be able to get event insurance or a commercial insurance policy like that. So that sounded like somebody was putting up such a big roadblock that they didn't want to entertain this topic. So that institution, I'm going to respond to uh, separately here and give them some tips and tricks to help figure out, okay, how do you make this work? Maybe you compromise on health insurance and having the individuals have to certify at certain points. For me in Miami, it was a lot of questions about behavior and student behavior. How do we make sure that students don't mix and mingle with other students? And it was this <clears throat> fear that, um, students from in other institutions would come and cause trouble. Well, I, in the years that we've been offering this, we've not had a single instance uh, of an intern causing so much as even a noise violation. So that fear is just kind of unfounded. And this is where I'm talking about clearing roadblocks. So asking, uh, experts like me to share case studies and answer and respond to questions where you say, 
you know, my institution is asking me to do X, Y, Z. In your experience, what do you think about that? And, and getting two or three examples from different institutions may help clear that roadblock. Also validating ideas as well. I'm thinking about doing this, what do you think? <clears throat> and if you're still hitting those roadblocks, try and use what's called Roger's trial ability. This is the idea where if you can get somebody to nudge just a little bit and get you to open up that door so that you can try the program, pilot it out, but you can still pull back the next summer if it doesn't go right, you'll be able to, to hopefully quell some of those fears and, and show them how successful a program like this can be. And then ultimately, if you are still hitting roadblocks and, they, and your leadership wants to hear more, Intern Housing Hub, Unique Venues, they do offer uh, consulting services for starting an intern program, uh, and that is available. Okay. But I see we have uh, some more questions coming in, and uh, it's about 2.37 at this point. So I told Corey I'd like to stop around 240 is to start answering all these questions. Um, and I know Corey has another poll that he'd like to ask. Um, so with that, uh, let me answer Whitney's question about cancellation process. So Whitney, in terms of our cancellation process, we offer students a very, very flexible cancellation. But we are very much upfront with them on what that is and what that means. And I'm gonna stop my slideshow so you all can see, see my face again. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, so with that, we, we allow them to cancel without penalty up to 14 days prior to their arrival. And after that 14 days, so from 14 to one, we keep their 25% deposit. But once they check in, we keep everything that they've paid because we're not able to resell that space like a hotel would. A hotel could have someone walk in off the street and be able to get that revenue back fairly easily. Um, but where we have to market and can only look at interns, you're not gonna get an intern walking in off the street to help uh, <laughs> cover that cost and be able to refund that individual. So um, we do have that on the website as well and I'll share that with Corey so that we, um, you know, I can get that to you, Whitney. <clears throat> Another question here, do you keep interns completely separated from the university student population? We did by floor our first year. And uh, then we kind of mixed it, um, but we still kept the suites and the apartments entirely interns or entirely university students. And like I mentioned, we'd, we'd not had a single incident. Um, now that's not to say there will never be an incident, but uh, we, we do you know, keep in constant communication. We treat them as if they are our students. And so we, we look at them, um, we communicate with them, we meet with them, we host programs. We'll take them to a baseball game. Um, so they, they really become University of Miami students over the course of the summer. And uh, in terms of Christian's question, we, we will mix traditional conference groups, but the way that we do it is we have an 18 and over building. Uh, so adults and college aides, and then we have our youth facilities, which is more of our 
cheerleading camps or ID tech, those types of groups that we do keep separate across campus. So let's see. I think that's all the questions that I see, Corey. I don't know if you've got more. So none that are coming up yet. So folks, we've, we've got 19 minutes, so don't be shy. If you've got any question related to this, I think that that's um, really kind of the, the spirit of today's session is that we really just want to be able to help you however we can. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to think of some of the, the common questions that I get just in my conversations with folks, because, you know, this is a, a new area for me too. It's something that I'm starting to learn about and help folks navigate too. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you, you talked about, you know, the math to hitting goals and what a length of stay looks like. D does University of Miami have a minimum length of stay? If so, what does that look like? That's a good question, Corey. <clears throat> so we, we have a minimum length of stay of 13 nights. And you say, why 13? Well, because what we found is that students like to come on a Sunday and leave on a Saturday. So rather than make them stay that Saturday night to hit 14, we just said, okay, we'll make it 13. And we have a differentiated rate for a shorter stay versus longer stays. So if you stay 13 nights to 28 nights, you actually, or yeah, 13 to 28 nights, you actually have a $10 uh, per night fee added given the short stay. And then if you stay more than 28 nights, you have 10, uh, that $10 fee comes off. Uh, so you're essentially getting a discount the longer you stay. Um, where that becomes important is it helps sway individuals that may be considering taking an internship that's maybe only a week or two weeks. And to be honest, what are you gonna learn in two weeks? Um, it could be a lot, but um, you're not gonna get the same experience you would as if you're staying uh, 10 weeks, 11 weeks and 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, from all of our interns that have stayed with us, our average length of stay is 74 nights. So for those thinking about it, you can use roughly 10 to 11 weeks. I know earlier I mentioned 11 to 12 weeks. Um, so anywhere within that range, you can kind of use as your basis for your projections. That's really helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Cause I'm thinking about some of the folks that we work with and um, to be quite honest, those who might have had a minimum length of stay are saying this year, like, we just want people on campus. So if you're here for three nights, you're here for three nights. Like, exactly. that's not a problem for us. Um, but I, whenever, so I was looking at some of the applications that had come through Intern Housing Hub for last year, most of the, and even the ones that have come through this year, actually, most, if not all, were for the max duration of the venue. Um, I was actually talking to one of our other clients, Seattle University, who said, because um, they're on a trimester, so they're like the middle of June through the middle of September or early September, and they were saying that they were working with an intern who wanted to stay, and it didn't fit within their window, so they stayed at a hotel for a week, and then they moved over to Seattle, and I think it's because of like the competitive advantage that a campus offers in terms of the flexibility with the length of stay, sublets and apartments might be very restrictive with how long or when people can move out after they've moved in. Um, and I also think it's the amenities and the price point as well. I think campuses really tend to be able to offer a lot, but I see there's more questions coming up. So I'll let you uh, take a look yeah. at those. Well, and, and I would add to that uh, before I, I touch on some of these questions that if your institution is struggling with academic year occupancy as well, look at these as options. Um, there are researchers that come during the fall and the spring mm -hmm. semester, the winter intercession. You know, so really when I talk about customizing this, this is really something you can pick up and take and bring to your institution and make it fit for your needs. So if you're, 
if your institution is running at 75%, your housing department's really struggling uh, because generally a budget's based on 84, 85%, somewhere within there uh, for academic year. And so if you're able to provide this as an opportunity, then you may be able to help save some components with your, with your department, your institution. And as we've all seen with COVID, uh, you never know what's gonna happen. So having these types of things in your back pocket to say, I've got an idea, but let's try it, um, really can make a difference. All right, so um, question here, how do you handle payments for groups versus individuals? So for groups, um, that one's pretty straightforward actually. We'll take a check. Uh, a, a wire transfer, or if the amount is low enough and, and they can, or they want to put it on a credit card, um, they can definitely, definitely do that. Um, the only thing we don't take is cash. Um, cash is a little bit harder for us to um, manage. And um, I don't necessarily want thousands of dollars uh, cash um, and the responsibility that that comes with. Um, for individuals, we do, you know, same thing, wire transfers, checks, credit cards. I will say 99% of the individuals generally put it on a credit or a debit card uh, that we've worked with. And uh, I've even worked out custom payment plans with the individuals to make it work too. So, you know, I told them if they were able to make X, amount as a deposit and come up with a payment plan that worked for them so that they could stick with, then we would honor it and we'd go for it. Um, you know, I've only missed out on one individual and that was uh, pretty, pretty easy to explain because I had all the documentation um, to go through that. So sure, somebody wasn't happy with me, but I thought I was doing the best I could for the individual. Um, and uh, a lot of times these are, these are opportunities that students get once in a lifetime. So any way you can help them uh, is, is going to be beneficial. How quickly can we turn rooms from the spring semester to summer housing? That's always my favorite question because that's always, uh, anytime I talk to an institution, it's always a struggle point. How do we get them out? flip it so that we can get new people in, and then the same thing on the back end. I used to work at the University of Tennessee, and I had a, a, a wonderful uh, maintenance staff there that could flip an entire building, so talking 300 beds, in one night uh, to get us going. And they, they hustled, they worked, they did everything they could to, to make that happen. Um, now, I'm not saying that I don't have a wonderful staff here. It just takes them a little bit longer. Um, so we're talking, you know, if I, if I really need the rooms, I can get it done within 24 to 48 hours, depending on the number, right? It's all about size of scale. Um, and then from there, Talking about our entire campus, probably talking a couple weeks in reality. Um, we have about 5,200 beds within our system right now. Um, and we systematically go through each area. So Christian's asking a good question about off-campus entertainment venues to get reduced rates. Yes, I definitely work with them. I work every contact I have. Um, I have a group account with the Miami Marlins. I have um, my name at the zoo. I've taken them snorkeling. Um, we've done some really cool stuff uh, with these interns and they love it because they're looking for something to do on the weekends and they're almost um, bored. Uh, on those Saturdays and Sundays. So the more opportunities you can provide them to meet and get together and hang out, they're just looking for friends. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the, the baseball game is always my favorite because we get two full coach buses, take them all down there, get them a hot dog. The Marlins are terrible. Uh, so, you know, it's all about the laughter and, and having fun. Uh, but, uh, but they almost always, you know, love, love those experiences. And then we ask them too, after that first one that we planned, what do you want to see us do? What, what do you want to do? Um, we set aside a little programming budget and it's just part of our, our expenses that we work in every year. I, I'm excited you brought that up because I was talking to someone um, who is considering building programming around their intern housing program and, and wanted to offer that as an additional amenity and didn't just want to have people check in and not build a community and meet people because in a lot of cases, people are traveling by themselves, not knowing anyone else that they might be staying near or interning with. So it's a great way to build that community and have some kind of emotional attachment to, you know, your venue and their experience, which I think is great. Yeah. And ultimately, remember, I, I mentioned that word of mouth is going to be your biggest success. Um, and if you just set them up with a bed and don't do anything else for them, they're going to remember that. Um, and you know, the more you can do for them within reason, you know, San Francisco, obviously, uh, where Christian that has, has tons of stuff to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always found something to do, even in the smallest cities I've been to. So there's definitely something and, uh, it could be kitschy, but you know what, they're going to bond through the kitschiness anyways. Uh, and they'll, they'll have fun. And I see one last question here from Ashley. Uh, we had a suggestion from our housing director to have a rate not based on number of beds so that we can utilize as many rooms as possible. Thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, that's, that's how I would um, create your rates uh, regardless of what you're doing. Um, yes, everything's kind of economies of scale, where if you know you're going to have a thousand beds and you know you're going to fill them, you could probably offer a cheaper rate because your expenses are pretty similar um, and you'd be able to figure that out along the way. But if you don't know if you're going to have one intern or 500, I would build your rate regardless of the number of beds you're gonna sell. So figure out what your expenses are gonna be, what it's gonna cost in terms of utilities and all those kind of things, the amenities you're gonna provide. And then after that, do the gut test. Does that rate look right? If you were an intern, would you pay for that? And then ask students, hey, we're thinking about doing this, with this, this, and this, here's the rate. Would you sign up for that? And, and put it through the test and validate it. Um, so that's what I would do for, for the rates there. See, Kristen's asking about what campus access. Uh, we give them the gym, we give them the pool, we give them the library. Um, you know, I really want them to feel like they're a part of our campus. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just one of those little things that we can do. We've worked out some rates with our gym and, and the pool on campus. The library doesn't charge us. Um, you know, and it amounts to maybe $5 a day. So while, you know, if we're talking the difference between 30 and $35 a night, when you do it across 84 nights or 74 nights, whatever you're going to do, you realize it ends up not actually being that much in the long run because you're saving on all those room turns that you no longer have to worry about. Or worse, you're actually making more money because your beds aren't sitting empty. So if you look at it from that angle, uh, you can look at the utilization uh, question as a way to gauge that. Uh, last question here that I see. 
Do you allow interns to have guests? If so, how do you handle that? It's a great, great question. Technically speaking, they're not supposed to have guests. And that's because we don't know if they're staying overnight. Um, we don't know who they are. Um, and uh, it's, it's a complicated thing to manage. Now, I have had students email our team and say, hey, uh, my significant other wants to come down for the weekend. Is that okay? As long as we know, and uh, I talk to our security team and kind of let them know and give them the heads up in advance, it's generally not been a problem. Um, but again, as I mentioned before, it doesn't mean that it couldn't be a problem in the future. Uh, so it's just something that we always keep an eye on. Um, but I would say go with your gut. If your campus behavior for your academic year students is to allow guests and you have a process in place for that, it's essentially the same. Um, so just keep those things in mind. Um, and as we wrap up here, definitely, definitely reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to answer questions for you all. Um, if if I wasn't clear on anything or you wanna go a little deeper, um, you know, I think Corey and I, as I mentioned, we talked about doing that second session. Uh, so we may look to schedule that, but I'd, I'd love to have feedback from you all uh, to see how it went. Awesome. Uh, we're getting a ton of uh, feedback, Richie, and I think that what you shared today is really resonating with folks. And just from what we know about the industry and hosting interns, if you're doing it for the summer, now is like the time that you're probably ramping up your marketing efforts, you're probably reviewing applications and getting things ready for that. So just because of that, we are kind of going to be taking a step back with the content that we will be offering related to intern housing information. Um, we want to make sure that you have the time in your day to fully focus on your own operations. But like Richie said, we do want to revisit things after this summer. Um, and maybe it's late summer or early fall that we've got something on the books. Um, but from what I know is that there's still a lot of folks out there that still have a decision to make about this year. And there are a lot that are already saying no to this year and, and yes to 2022. So we really hope that in the fall, we can keep providing this kind of expertise and information to help you really maximize um, this opportunity for revenue, growth and development and community, um, like building a community around this program. Um, so we really hope that you can join us. If you haven't already, please feel free to uh, let us know what you thought about today's session using the session evaluation form. I have a list of things that I'll be following up with. One is a recording of this session and some of the follow-up things that uh, Richie said that he'll, he'll send to me, which I'll pass along to everyone else. And I'll also include Richie's email address so that if anyone has a question directly for him, that uh, you can email him and I'm sure he'd be happy to help. So thanks everyone so much. I have on the screen one final uh, reminder about our upcoming education and our unique venues university resource. Um, but thanks so much for joining us today. We hope to see you on a future educational experience and webinar, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Richie. Oh, thank you, Corey. Thank you, everyone, for coming today.